All right. Great. I'm very excited to be here and share part of my dissertation research with you all. First, I'd like to thank my thesis committee, lab mates, my um, collaborators at the Cleveland National Forest, many numerous undergraduate volunteers that um, help me during field work and our many funding sources. Without all of their support, this large project would not be possible. And I'd also like to thank the planning committee for inviting me here to speak today. So, as the movie expands, this puts more people in conflict with wildfire. And protecting homes and mitigating wildfire risk often leads to fuel modification. As um, Alex and Hugh said, we've built these areas already. We've committed to protecting them. I really like that. Thank you. And in Southern California, these areas are often created in chaparral. As you can see here, this dozer line has been cut through the chaparral all the way to the mineral soil. And these intense disturbances cause ecological impacts. These disturbed areas are rapidly invaded by non-native plant species, and this contributes to the type conversion of chaparral to non-native grassland, as long with um, too frequent fire in the landscape. These areas also serve as sites for further degradation through being used as illegal shooting ranges, OHB use leading to soil erosion, and as dumping and littering sites. But fuel defense zones can be critical landscape features for firefighting operations. They decrease the fire line intensity, they increase the surface contact of fire retardant, making it more effective. They allow firefighters to access these often very difficult, steep, and rugged terrain areas, and they serve as very important anchor points for lighting backgrounds. However, it is critical that we understand how to balance the ecological impacts of fuel management and the stability of chaparral in California. And the areas we focus on are these disturbed areas that become invaded by non-native annual grass, such as fuel breaks, road size, and areas within the movie. Because these areas are often ignition hotspots. This is U.S. Forest Service emissions data that shows the southern end of the Los Padres National Forest and the Angeles National Forest in the green polygons, and all those purple dots are ignitions. And you can see that major roadways, like the 5 freeway, is dotted with so many lines, uh, dots, it's basically a line feature. Numerous forest roads also serve as major ignition areas, and um, regions that butt up against urban zones, like in Los Angeles, again, numerous emissions. And so this is definitely a really big issue that we can hope to address by improving the fire resiliency in these types of landscapes. And we focus on invasive annual grasses because of their contribution to wildfires, as a few of us have mentioned already. They dry rapidly, but they do not decompose on the landscape, meaning that when they grow in the winter, they leave kindling in summer. Grass is an easily ignitable fuel that carries fire into the chaparral, propagates these fires, creating larger and more frequent fires on the landscape. And as was mentioned, we're committed to these already built landscapes and protecting them. So firefighters do not want these areas to go back to chaparral. They want to be able to utilize these areas to protect their homes and communities. And so what kind of locations am I describing? Um, defensible space principles, zones one and two, those areas closest to structures. Roadside emission corridors, as we've mentioned. And what if staging areas and fire camps were full of stipe and scoltia and not yellow star thistle and brome? This, in this photo, this is a fire camp where those trucks are going in and out of the forest to fight the fire. All those circles are yellow stars with full of seeds. Bad. <laughs> and fuel defense zones within communities and protecting vital infrastructure like telecoms and utilities. So, my research focuses on, can we go from something that is grass-dominated and ignitable to something that uses native species to reduce wildfire risk, improve ecological benefits, and still allow for firefighting operations? Well, what would be some desirable characteristics of fuels then? We know that plant traits influence their ignitability. Having a smaller fuel load would be beneficial, so just the amount of biomass per unit area, less chance of ignition, also producing less dead litter on the landscape. Dead tissues and plants are more easily ignitable than living tissue. And in that living tissue, you want a higher live fuel moisture content. There's more water in the plant tissues, it takes more energy for that piece of fuel to ignite. 
And then, of course, we can actually test ignitability in the lab, which I'll talk about later. So the central question of this chapter of my dissertation research is, how do native and non-native plants differ in their fuel and fire characteristics and their ecological benefits? So in order to answer this question, we conducted a restoration project in the Los Padres National Forest in Santa Barbara, where we established 108 um, experimental plots inside an actively used um, and managed fuel break. This is the East Camino CL fuel break. It protects and divides um, the front country ranges from the southern coastal cities, like Goleta and things that Max just talked about. And we established two different plant community groups. We outplanted a bunch of grassland and then seeded an annual wildfire mix to get a diversity of different plants and see how maybe their different fuel structures could differ. We weeded these plots for the first two years of the project and then let them go naturally. And then we compared these to what was the current dominant vegetation on the landscape, which is going to be our control plots, which was filled, of course, with annual grasses, sun mustards, and yellow star thistle. For our measurements, we measured fuel load, so they're not a biomass per meter squared. We measured the percent cover of those plots that had litter and the depth of that litter, so this is all dead material plus thatch. And we measured live fuel moisture content of species within these plots over time. And then lastly, which I'll get to at the end, is we tested their ignitability in the lab. For our ecological benefits, we decided to look at pollinating services, so the amount of flowers available to pollinators to use and the diversity of those flowers and then uh, habitat used by some animals, which I'll explain how we measure that when we get there. And these are some of my preliminary results from 2020 and 2022. So for my graphs, the dates we know the x-axis, each line is going to be a different color for each community plot. The black line is the non-native species. So looking at field load, we saw that at the beginning, our restored plots were smaller in biomass, right? They were just about restored. But by the end of three years, that fuel load for our community plots were the same as what was out there on the landscape. However, this is a very different story when we look at letter depth and the percent letter cover. For all three years, non-native community plots, these annual grasses, had a higher amount of dead biomass on the landscape, much more litter cover, meaning they have more fuel continuity. And also, we see that their litter depth is trending upward, meaning that they're accumulating dead biomass on the landscape. While our native community plots didn't really see that pattern, in fact, they're kind of consistent, meaning they're not accumulating dead biomass on the landscape. Those tissues are capable of decomposing over time and don't stay there like grass patch can, which is a good thing. Look, this is our live field moisture monitoring data. We measure this much more intensely every three weeks or to a month. And so I have added a new line here. This green line is Shanice. It's the live field moisture collected from a nearby forest or a station for comparison. And we see the pattern. We would expect plants wet up in the winter, dry down during the summer, wet up during the winter, and dry down, which we would expect for our California and Mediterranean climate. Um, and we can see this. Dashed red line is the critical threshold determined for high fire danger for Shemis. And in these three admittedly dry years, Shemis tracks that line very well. But let's just focus in on the dry summers where fire danger is highest. We see that our community plots that have native species have consistently high live fuel moisture throughout the summer. And um, this is important because that's, of course, when the fire danger is the greatest. But in particularly dry years, like in 2021, we had a six months um, advantage of live fuel moisture, where if it was just the grasses that we had in the landscape, that would have all been dead, ignitable material. And even when our annual plants eventually do die, right, they're going to lose live fuel moisture. And we saw in the previous graph, those, that dead biomass is going to decompose. It's not building on the landscape. So that's also still a good sign. So how do we test plants in uh, their ignitability? Oh, so we take them into the lab and harvest whole individuals. We superheat hot metal fragments and use torches, and we apply them to the plants, and we measure risk of ignition as the proportion of those samples that have ignited. So let's just, oh yeah, we're gonna do the loop thing. There we go. So let's just look at one sampling date in August. This is, again, ignition risk, so how many plants have ignited. We have now on the x-axis the different species we've measured, and we'll see that there 
ago that the annual grasses had the highest risk of ignition in this period with fire dangers highest. Our native bunch grass diaper pulpera, much less, and shrubs such as adenosuma, buckwheat, and some forbs, those are all zeros, and they also never ignited during the entire study period, much less the annual plants. For our ecological benefits, so this we counted just a number of flowers that could be available for pollinators or as a service that we care about. You see at the peaks at the end of this graph in the springs that you see a trend that we do have more flowers available for pollinating um, um, for pollinators over time um, and in floral diversity as well. So we use the Shannon's diversity index to say how is the wealth of different types of flowers available for pollinators? We see again in the springs at the peaks of those graphs a much greater floral diversity available. So our native communities provide these um, pollination service, pollinating service benefit um, in the springs. And the native community plots that they do have some flowers, but usually it's right one mustard or a yellow star plant, much less diverse and less available. Um, for our habitat use, what we did is I quantified the beautiful part of animal disturbance in my restoration project. So we quantified and counted or did the percent cover of Gopher mounds, footprints, um, signs of a river getting plants ripped up out of the ground, footprints, things like that, um, gopher holes, and we summed all that covered together as just evidence of animal use. And what we see is that in the first year that uh, we had a lot of animal use in the annuals plot and not a lot of use in where we planted perennial plants because they were small, it's very kind of barren, they were still establishing, and some use in non-native plants. But by 2022, we see a increase in animal use in our experimental plots, and a, maybe a slight decrease in non-native. But by 2023, we see almost no animal use in those plots, right next to our native restored plots, and a big increase of animal use in where we restore native plants. And so we see more evidence of use, and I think especially in summer, where grasses are dead and have cured, we have living plants that would be more nutritious or valuable for whatever these animals are using and harvesting. And so we think that's a great sign. So just to synthesize our results and how do native and non-native plants differ in these traits, um, we would want a small fuel load. Well, we, we broke even, didn't make it worse. We would want something that produces less dead litter and biomass in our landscape. That's a check for native species. We want a higher life fuel moisture content over summer. Check for native species. And are they actually less ignitable, Robert? Yes, they are less ignitable. And we saw them also provide more pollinator services and native species plots and more evidence of habitat use. All wins for native species in these areas. Now, what I'd like to use the remaining of my time to describe is how we're taking the lessons that we've learned at these plot scale and are now moving to landscape scale and are, I've already established several plots um, at the acre size. So we're using herbicide and a combination of drill seeding and hydro seeding to test how do we actually implement this at the landscape scale and what does that look like? So these projects are in the LP and the CNF areas and I'm just gonna show some very brief results since only have two minutes left. Um, this is a, just looking at how we're actually able to reduce the amount of thatch and grass on the landscape using herbicide treatments. You can see a very stark difference of where our herbicide treatment stopped, much less grass, and greatly decreased fuel continuity. And just to show you a few figures that um, we were able to control graph there in red is the amount of non-native plant density, and we were able to decrease that um, significantly using herbicide treatment. And looking at native plant density, we go from zero to when we restore and use herbicide treatments, we are capable of establishing these native plants on the landscape. And then we summed up, well, how much, what, how did we affect the fine fuel load, this ignitable amount of fuel? We found that by doing these restoration treatments, that we had a three and a half times less fine fuel in these areas that are easily ignitable, which is really good for fire management. So can we go from grass dominated and ignitable to using native species? I would say yes. Native herbaceous species can provide a less ignitable vegetation cover that allows for active wildfire suppression operations while still boosting the ecological value of these strategic areas within the woody and along the roadsides. And importantly, this demonstrates that fire resiliency of the landscape is reduced with the invasion of non-native animal 
grasses. And hopefully, if we communities and agencies invest and care about these areas, and maybe they're filled with poppies and lupines and not nasty yellow star or um, metacago, that this would hopefully reduce the mistreatment of these areas and increase our respect of the land and um, reduce that further degradation. And I think all of this is a real win-win for managers and ecologists. Thank you.